This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, November 24th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, as the state's only level one trauma center reaches capacity and its staff grows fatigued, administrators call for another statewide mask mandate. Then the state health officer meets with members of the Senate to discuss vaccine distribution. Plus, college students return home after an unorthodox semester. We talked to one senior about her experience. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Healthcare leaders at the University of Mississippi Medical Center say the number of COVID-19 infections and hospitalizations is steadily increasing. Mississippi saw its highest single-day total on Saturday with 1,972 new coronavirus cases reported by the health department. Hospitalizations were also up 32% last week. Dr. Luann Woodward of UMMC says with daily cases creeping close to the 2,000 mark, it's only a matter of time before the state surpasses it. I do have grave concerns that over this next week, in fact, we will tip over that. If you look at the number of cases that are being diagnosed in school-age children, that is going up dramatically, as well as the number of new cases. And as we all know, what follows that are the number of hospitalizations here at University of Mississippi Medical Center, just like everywhere else across the state. We are seeing increased numbers of hospitalizations, increased numbers of COVID patients. Um, And as I have shared with you before, during this season, we are full. We pretty much 24-7, seven days a week, run at a state of what we call capacity, meaning all of our beds are full. We get a little bit of a break in any given day for a few hours, and the patients that are waiting on those beds in our emergency department immediately backfill those open beds. The capacity issue is not unique to Mississippi. Dr. Alan Jones says he's received calls from hospitals across the region looking for available beds. The reports that we have is that hospitals around the region are full. Obviously, um, last week on the same day, we got requests from Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, Missouri, to transfer patients to us. And obviously, we're getting a lot of transfer requests from within the state also. Uh, So that just goes to show you, I mean, it's, it's not unusual for us to get the occasional transfer request from, say, uh, western Alabama or eastern Louisiana, but highly unusual for us to get transfer requests from northern Tennessee or or Missouri. Um, So places are just packed full, uh, and they can't get patients that need to be in ICUs into ICUs. With the hospital operating at capacity for an extended period, resources are required. Dr. Jones says UMMC has all the supplies it needs, but its human resources are growing exhausted. We feel pretty good about our supplies, about our PPE. Um, we, I don't think we would say we're out of the woods and we're not worried about it at all, but the thing that we're worried the most about most uh, is our human resources. Our physicians and our nurses are extraordinarily tired associated with this work. Um, And it is frustrating to see uh, the lack or uh, what appears to be the lack of uh, adherence to masking policies and some of the other things in place to try to decrease the spread of the virus. Um, I'm an emergency physician, and I can tell you that, you know, the ER at baseline is a pretty chaotic, unpredictable place. Um, that has to be able to move pretty quickly. And uh, when you layer something that's highly infectious like COVID on top of it, it becomes even more complicated and exhausting. 
emergency room nurses like Lacey Ward are feeling the brunt of that exhaustion. After working for a number of years, she says she never questioned her line of work until the pandemic. I have never questioned my job or being a nurse until the summer when the numbers were so bad. It made me question if this is what I was really meant to do because it was so defeating to come in and have so many people that were so sick and that were dying and couldn't be with their loved ones. When you're, you know, on the phone and letting somebody say goodbye to their family member and you have to be there for that private moment and you've done literally everything you can, it's very defeating to see in the community people having parties and, you know, gathering. We all want to be with our families and I'd like to be with mine. Um, I have three boys and I get terrified every day that I come home that I may give it to them. They are going to school, but the amount of exposure I have is exponential. Um, So we're doing our best to take care of every person that comes in the door. That's what we're here for. That's what we're meant to be. But when you have a full department and you still have people walking in the door, you have to figure out how to take care of them in different ways and move people around. And um, there's only so many rooms. With the surge expected to worsen as the holiday season approaches and the weather gets colder, Dr. Woodward believes it's time for another statewide mask mandate. She says the piecemeal approach is not proving to be effective. From the standpoint of certainly myself and my own opinion and the leadership here at the medical center, we do very much believe that we should have a statewide mask mandate. And it's for two reasons, really. Even with a statewide mask mandate, not 100% of the people are going to comply. You'll still have people who don't comply. But I think that we have some some reasonable um, evidence to believe that the county-by-county approach is not working. It's, it's, it's maybe helping, but it's certainly not doing what we need it to do. It is not turning these numbers around for us. And then the other reason is, you know, with the, with the governor being the leading state, the highest level of state official in the state of Mississippi, I think that sends a big signal for, for that position to say, we are at a critical point, people. We need to have a statewide mass mandate. There are currently mask mandates in 22 of Mississippi's 82 counties. There have been over 20,000 new cases of COVID-19 this month. Coming up, the state health officer meets with members of the Senate to discuss vaccine distribution. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is Mississippi Edition. I'm Karen Brown. Mississippi is expected to get about 90,000 doses of coronavirus vaccines to distribute by late December. Pharmaceutical manufacturer Pfizer has a vaccine being reviewed by the Federal Drug Administration under an emergency request. State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs is optimistic by the end of the year, a handful of vaccines could be approved by the FDA. He appeared before the Senate Public Health and Welfare Committee yesterday to update them on the process. We do anticipate probably mid-December or late December, we probably will have an early distribution of vaccines. It's going to come in several different phases. Um, our, our first phase, we um, anticipate about um, 90,000 doses that will be distributed primarily for uh, frontline healthcare workers, first responders, ph- pharmacists, National Guard, that sort of thing. Um, And then uh, phase 1B will be giving it to long-term care folks, both residents and staff. And then once we get to phase 2, we'll be targeting broader population, but also hitting some higher-risk sort of individuals. And phase 2 will probably be further into the winter, maybe even to the spring, when we get to the sort of volume of vaccines. But if we get more than one, if we get the Pfizer, and then we also get the Moderna, and then we also get the AstraZeneca, we're layering one upon the other, and that's going to be something that will help us have better vaccine capacity, going into this into the winter 
distribution of the vaccine will vary during each phase. Dr. Dobbs says the initial phase for frontline health care workers will be conducted primarily in-house. For the first phase, phase 1A, we're going to use these um, primarily these um, uh, closed points of, uh, of, of dispensing. Basically, these are sort of emergency plans we work on all the time, like if you had an anthrax or whatever. We have these sort of pre-planned sort of operations with major health systems and other folks, and we'll, we'll give them the vaccine and let them do it, right? So like UMC, we have an allocation for them. We're going to have so many thousand doses, we just give it to them, and they have a plan to get it to their people. So we're going to distribute the um, the planning and also the execution to our health partners. But additionally, we will plan to have uh, Department of Health distribution sites uh, probably through these drive-through clinics like we have right now, and that will be for other healthcare workers and, front- and first-line folks who would not have access to the other sorts of closed pods. Make sure everybody has access to it. And then as we get to 1B, if we look at the nursing homes, um, all the nursing homes in Mississippi have signed up to work with CVS and Walgreens to be uh, their partners to give vaccine to them. And we'll also support other long-term care centers like assisted living and places like that that may not be signed up for that initiative. And then once we get to 2B, we're going to be looking at more normal distribution chains that are going to be sort of augmented by our sort of drive-through capacity. The development of the vaccines comes as Mississippi and the nation are experiencing heightened transmission of the coronavirus. Dobbs says at this point, the vaccine may be the only thing to stop the waterfall. It's very much kind of like a uh, a, uh, a water faucet and a mop analogy, right? Um, we're getting better with the mops, but we have the, the faucet wide open. And until we turn the faucet off, we're really not going to be very effective. And the thing that's going to turn the faucet off, since we don't have the collective will to really you know, pull back in our behaviors, um, it's going to take the vaccine. I mean, I've, I've been, I, I'll, I'll just confess to you guys, I'm exhausted trying to convince folks to do stuff. Um, and it's just going nowhere. Dobbs warns that until a vaccine is widely available, residents should continue best mitigation practices. He says cases and deaths are preventable. Without a doubt, most of the cases that we're going to see over the next few weeks and most of the deaths are entirely preventable. With very simple stuff, all the things that we could do to prevent coronavirus could be done with zero harm to the economy, right? But there's going to be some inconvenience. There would be people would not have to be able to go to soccer games or maybe you'd cancel some tournaments and maybe you'd have to wear a mask and maybe you'd have to have a small group and not have big parties. Um, But we have chosen very clearly to prioritize social events over disease transmission. And part of that's because... We have, um, we're tired of it, and there has been some effort to minimize the severity of the illness. Most people won't die, but a lot of people will die. And it's my job and our job in public health to try to prevent deaths and preserve health and prosperity. So anyway, just understand that we can do more if we're willing to. While deaths are on the rise again, Dr. Dobbs says there have been vast improvements in critical care treatment for COVID-19, but he warns the in-hospital mortality rate is still at an uncomfortable level. It's starting to creep up, but we do expect for that to increase pretty substantially over the next several weeks. We always know that uh, deaths are going to follow cases. If we talk about treatment, we have seen some improvement in in in-hospital mortality with some new treatments, but still it's only going to be... Um, it's going to be a decline from maybe like 15 to 16 percent mortality to maybe 11 to 12 percent. So we're still going to have a substantial mortality burden. And if you look at the number of people who've died in Mississippi, thus far in in Mississippi, we've had 5,000 more deaths than we've expected. 5,000 people have died that would not have died because of COVID. And we're just, you know, only about six or seven months into this. Uh, and if you look, and if we if we look at the number of people who've had it so far in Mississippi, about between 12 and 15 percent of people have probably had it in Mississippi. If everybody in the state of Mississippi got coronavirus, we would have an additional 30,000 deaths. It's just a simple math, and it's just simple reality of it. Um, so anyway, expect more deaths going into the next few weeks. Dobbs also took questions from lawmakers. Republican Senator Kevin Blackwell of South Haven asked if COVID-19 deaths were being inflated. Dobbs says there are layers of review in the process of certifying a COVID death. There's a lot of anecdotal stories going around. Somebody has COVID, they get over, get hit by a car, die, and the cause of death is COVID. So are these deaths that we have here in Mississippi actually from COVID? 
Yeah, th that's been an interesting tale. Um, there's how we get COVID deaths is if the hospitals have somebody who dies of COVID, they tell us. And the other thing is if we get a death certificate that the coroner said the patient died of COVID, then we look at it. We pull the metric records and make sure it was from a COVID-related illness. So there's multiple levels. But if you look at our total number of deaths year over year, we have about 4,000 or so excess COVID deaths that we've counted. But if you look at the number of people who've died this year compared to the previous three-year average, it's over 5,000 more. So they're tracking perfectly. We've had some of these weird sort of goofy things of so-and-so had a motorcycle wreck and they got counted as COVID. And when we've heard these, we said, okay, send it to us and we'll look at it. And it's always been sort of a Facebook phantom sort of thing. It's kind of made the rounds. So, but if you hear about something weird like that, let us know. The other thing is if someone gets coronavirus, they count one time, right? We don't ever, if you get tested 10 times, you count as one case. Um, I know there's a lot of um, sort of weird theories out there, but if there's something that needs clarity, I'd love to um, answer y'all's questions so we can debunk some of these things. The vaccine is not expected to be widely available for the general public until next spring. Dobbs says until then, it's imperative that residents wear masks and limit social gatherings. He says there is a healthy middle ground between wide open and lockdown that has gotten lost in the rhetoric. You know, we don't have a consensus of communications. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, debriefing on this after this is over. I think that if we could all be in lockstep, we, we, we've got a dichotomous approach. It's either locked down or wide open. And, and the, the conversation is invariably in the wrong direction of, you know, freedom and business, right, versus lockdown and oppression. And that's just a crazy dichotomy. All we have to do, I mean, just very sincerely, if, if we would all only have small gatherings, if we wouldn't do um, unstructured school stuff like, um, you know, choir and whatever, and I mean, you know, in public or when they're all together, and if we would, um, you know, wear masks in public or, um, you know, or just stay apart from one another and do it outdoors, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I didn't one time say close a business. I didn't say one time to close a church or close a school, and we, we can't vacillate. We just have not been able to vacillate toward that healthy middle. The Senate Health, Public Health, and Welfare Committee will continue today. Coming up, college students return home after an unorthodox semester. We talked to one senior about her experience. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Slowly we started, you know, picking these turtles up and saving them. I'll stop traffic, grab one out of the road. And then our friends found out and our vet would call us. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. We are now a full-fledged, nonprofit turtle rescue. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. After what can be considered an unorthodox semester, many of Mississippi's college students are returning home. Virtual classes, canceled sports seasons, and quarantines have made campus life different for many. And now a longer than usual winter break awaits them. Nicole Linnelli is a senior at Mississippi State. She shares how this fall semester compares to others. Um, it's been very different because it's kind of like you have to be self-motivated. All of my classes were online. I probably stepped into the classroom like 15 times just for labs. But that's, yeah, it was really, really different. Um, it, I kind of struggled with it a little bit because I need that motivation from my peers and my teachers. But we made it and it was safe. So that's good. Do you live on campus or off? I live off campus in an apartment. So you don't have to worry about a dining hall? You eat at home? Yes, I've loved that aspect. It's my first year to live in an apartment, so that's been super nice, especially with the pandemic. Sure. You said you're a communications major. How do you see your future plans working out? Do you think the pandemic is going to affect that? I think it may. I'm really not sure what's going to happen. Um, I graduate in May, so I'm about to have to start applying for jobs, and I've been looking... I know people who have gotten jobs right away, 
some companies are like really maximizing on the remote uh, job aspect and then some people are having to lay off a lot of people. So I know some people that graduated last year that are still looking and some that got hired right away. So I think it just depends on your personal experience. As a senior, do you feel a little bit cheated because of how things have changed your final year and how it should be much more social and, you know, gratifying? Yeah, in a way I do. But at the end of the day, I understand why. And like, I, I'm not, I try not to get caught up in like, what could have been and just make the most of what we have now. I'm not a huge sports gal. So a couple of my friends and I will just have brunch on Saturdays at one of our apartments. And that's been a safe way to hang out. And like, it's more personal. So there's good and bad. So coming home, tell me about your household. How many people did you come home to? So I have a brother that's also in college and then um, a mom and a dad and then the people that are at risk are my grandparents who live like 20 minutes away, but I haven't seen them yet. What did you do, if anything, to prepare for coming home? I quarantined for a couple of days and then got tested before I came home. Mississippi State was so great to offer free testing for four days for the students that are going home. And it was a drive through You didn't have to have an appointment. So that's what me and a lot of my friends did. Are you waiting 14 days before you see your grandparents? Yes, I am. Tell me about your other friends or or, um, fellow students. Are they behaving the same way you are? Are there people who are being a little more lax about it? There are people that are being more lax about it. I know that they aren't – a lot of the people – People that are more lax may be going home and not seeing family this year. So that's some experiences. But most of my friends took advantage of the free testing and tried to stay away from people as much as possible. With exams, you do. Some people have to go into their classrooms, but a lot of them just try to stay to themselves and then get tested before returning home. You said your brother, also in college, came home or is yes. coming home. Did he take the same precautions you did? He did. He got. He is getting tested today. It's the today's the last day that it's offered. So my parents really like wanted that to be something that we do. So he is a part of the baseball team. So he did have to go to practices. But other than that, he does as much social distancing and safe precautions that he can. And then he got tested, but. He didn't get to quarantine like I did. Has anyone in your family or that you've been close to tested positive? I tested positive in August. Whenever we first got back, almost everyone we know got COVID um, in the certain like circles on campus. And I was lucky to not have a horrible experience. I am really young. but um, So I tested positive, but that's it. Did you have any symptoms? I was asymptomatic. I was super tired, though. That's the only thing that I would say is a symptom that I had, which I felt really lucky. Um, But my fatigue lasted so much longer than when I had the virus. My fatigue lasted months after. I think I just probably got my normal energy back, which was really hard having to wake up and sit at the computer all day, like next to my bed. It was hard being tired all the time. Now that you are home, are you going to take extra precautions about going out in public or, you know, you're in a new location? Uh, Do you have any concerns about where you go and who you're with? Definitely. I wouldn't say that I'm going to be hanging out with many friends over this break. I don't want to give my parents anything or my grandparents. I'd rather keep my circle small and just see my friends. I can text them, I can call them, and then I can see them when I get back to school, the ones that I do choose to see. So while I'm at home, I try not to go anywhere if it's not necessary. Well, we wish you the very best and your family. We hope everyone stays healthy. Nicole Lanelli is a senior at Mississippi State University. Nicole, thanks for talking with us. Yeah, thanks. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. 
Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening.